May 1945. The war in the Pacific is nearing its end, and you're standing on the flight deck of the USS Enterprise. The Air Boss has just launched 30 Hellcats and Dauntless dive bombers for a strike on Japanese positions. In two hours, they'll return, low on fuel, damaged, and exhausted. But there's a deadly problem waiting for them. The Enterprise's flight deck, like every carrier in World War II, is just 872 feet long, with one way in and one way out. Recovering planes was a slow and dangerous dance. One aircraft lands every 90 seconds, hooks an arresting wire, taxis forward, and clears space for the next. With 30 planes in the air and only 20 minutes of fuel left, the math never worked. The last planes landed on fumes. One crash could halt the entire cycle while others circled above, burning away their remaining fuel. And once every plane was back on deck, the ship turned into a floating bomb. Wings overlapping, aircraft loaded with fuel and ordnance parked from bow to stern. Launching another strike required an hour of pushing, towing, and re-spotting before the deck was ready again. It was called the deck cycle problem, and it strangled American air power. Admiral Mark Mitcher of Task Force 58 knew his massive carriers could hold a hundred aircraft, but their straight decks meant only one major strike per day. The Japanese faced the same fate at Midway in 1942, when the Akagi, Kaga, and Soryu were caught with decks crammed full of aircraft and fuel. They couldn't launch or recover, and in five minutes, American dive bombers from the Enterprise turned three proud carriers into flaming wrecks. That disaster proved that the straight-deck design, unchanged since the 1920s, was more than inefficient. It was lethal. After Midway, both navies began tracking deck cycle efficiency, the time a carrier was useless between strikes. The results were grim. The Yorktown needed 93 minutes, the Saratoga 108, and Japan's Shokaku over two hours. Pilots died not from enemy fire, but from running out of fuel waiting to land. Commander Wade McCluskey, the man who'd led the midway attack, wrote that American carriers were built for one-punch fights, but trapped in a 15-round war. Whoever launched first would win, because the other side would still be busy clearing its deck. While American admirals struggled in the Pacific, British officers in the North Atlantic quietly searched for a fix. Their carriers were smaller and more cramped, but in 1943, Captain Matthew Slattery of HMS Illustrious began experimenting with the radical idea of letting planes land while others stayed parked forward. He painted a white line down the port side, creating a narrow landing lane. It worked once before a misaligned sea fire clipped a parked aircraft, but the idea, dividing the deck into independent sections, was born. Then physicist Dennis Campbell took the concept further. In 1944, he proposed cutting the aft flight deck at a five-deck angle to port. Aircraft could land on the angled portion while others launched from the bow. It sounded insane, but the Royal Navy tested it on HMS Triumph, painting a crude angled runway and repositioning the arresting wires. Lieutenant Commander Eric Brown, the test pilot, landed perfectly and cleared the deck while another aircraft launched. Two simultaneous operations, something no carrier had ever achieved. The British proved the concept, but the war ended before it could be perfected. The reports were shelved and forgotten, until 1951. In Maryland, U.S. Navy Test Pilot Commander William Jocko Boone rediscovered Campbell's work while hearing constant claims that jet aircraft would make carriers obsolete. Jets were faster, heavier, and required longer decks. The straight deck couldn't handle them. But Boone saw the British had been on to something. Their five-degree angle wasn't enough, though. If the deck were angled eight to ten under, a pilot who missed all the arresting wires, known as a bolter, could simply throttle up and take off again without hitting parked planes. Boone painted the new layout on USS Midway's flight deck in 1951, repositioned the arresting gear, and tested it himself. 
Flying an F-9F Panther at 145 knots, he landed on what looked like a turning deck, and it worked flawlessly. Then another jet launched from the bow. Recovery. Launch. Recovery. Launch. Twelve landings and twelve takeoffs in 18 minutes, operations that once took over an hour. On one pass, Boone deliberately missed the wires. Instead of crashing, he climbed away safely. Watching from the island, Rear Admiral Apollo Sutsek knew instantly. This wasn't just an improvement, it was the future of carrier aviation. By 1952, the Navy began converting its Essex-class carriers. It wasn't easy. Every system, from arresting gear to catapults, had been designed for a straight deck. The island superstructure had to move, the hydraulics rerouted, and steam catapults installed. USS Antietam became the first operational angled deck carrier. She deployed to Korea in 1953, and within weeks proved the concept in combat. Antietam's air boss, Commander William Sisko, recorded 68 sorties in 12 hours, 74% more than her sister ship, Kearsarge. Deck availability jumped from 42% to 79%, meaning pilots returning from combat could land almost any time instead of circling on empty tanks. The angled deck saved lives. Damaged aircraft could land safely. Planes with live ordnance could trap immediately. And missed landings were no longer fatal. By the end of the Korean War, Antietam was flying nearly twice as many missions per day as any straight-deck carrier. The evidence was overwhelming. The Navy ordered emergency conversions across the fleet. When Captain John Cromelin reported back to Washington, he summed it up simply. Angled deck increases striking power by 85%. Every unmodified carrier fights at half capacity. The next step was a new generation of ships built around this geometry from the keel up. In 1954, the USS Forrestal launched as the first supercarrier with a fully integrated eight-angled deck, four steam catapults, and the ability to launch and recover aircraft simultaneously. Her air wing could fly 170 sorties per day, almost double the best World War II carriers. During exercises in 1960, Forrestal's crew performed 147 sorties in 24 hours, proving continuous. Overlapping flight operations were now standard. The Soviet Navy quickly realized what this meant. American carriers were no longer vulnerable during launches or recoveries. They could project uninterrupted power for days. By the late 1950s, the U.S. Navy's four Forrestal-class ships, Forrestal, Saratoga, Ranger, and Independence, could each generate the combat output of three World War II carriers. The angled deck had turned the aircraft carrier into a platform of relentless, rolling thunder. And it didn't stop there. Every modern carrier since, Nimitz, Ford, Queen Elizabeth, Shandong, Vikramaditya, uses the same eight-degree geometry that Boone painted on Midway in 1951. Even vertical landing jets and drone carriers use angled layouts to improve flow and safety. The innovation outlasted the technology it was designed for. It works for prop planes, jets, and stealth fighters alike because it's based on physics, not fashion. Seventy years later, the angled deck remains untouched. It doubled carrier striking power, eliminated the deadliest hazard in naval aviation, and made continuous air warfare possible. Commander Boone didn't set out to reshape naval history. He just wanted to keep his pilots alive. But with nothing more than a paint line and a few degrees of geometry, he built the foundation for seven decades of naval dominance. Stand on the deck of a modern carrier today, and you're still standing on his idea. An idea so perfect, it never needed to change.